Hello, this is Sean Roberts. I'm Chief Technologist for Lincoln Network, and I have with me Daniel Takish, a Regulatory Policy Fellow at the Niskanen Center. There are a few laws that DCMA and the, the CFAA that have been uh, uh, written in such a broad way that they can be applied basically at will or at whim by uh, 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 different parties that have uh, many varied interests. Do we think that there's hope that we can start to um, at least pare these things down with new legislation or maybe even uh, do away with these laws in favor of uh, maybe uh, more isolated laws uh, that are specifically like the, for instance, the CFAA for technology and one for autos um, as is possibly one uh, kind of extraneous example. Yeah, uh, so that raises a number of interesting points. And now uh, that you brought up um, Section 1201 of the DMCA, uh, which is the anti-circumvention provisions where it includes penalties for folks who um, break digital locks uh, or circumvent technological prevention measures, whatever your preferred jargon is, mm. um, you know, to change copyrighted code. Uh, or we talk, you know, we discussed uh, how violating the terms of service raises computer fraud uh, abuse act um, implications. I think those are uh, very troubling provisions of the law first, because it uh, has serious implications for private property. Now, like whether or not it's ridiculous to attach criminal penalties uh, with breaking your company's, you know, work computer mm -hmm. uh, violation. You know, if I own my iPhone, if I own my car, if I own, uh, you know, I'm a hospital and I own a ventilator, uh, it's it's a thumb in the eye of um, property rights as correctly understood to not allow people to do as they please with it. You know, if I could set it on fire, uh, I mean, maybe my local zoning board would get mad at me if I set my car on fire in my front lawn. Uh, mm -hmm. But if I could set it on fire or smash it with a hammer, uh, I should damn well be able to fix it. So first, there's just a basic property rights issue. Um, right. And it's certainly a cruel irony uh, when people you know, invoke intellectual property, you know, and defending property rights in order to infringe the property rights um, of others, you know, in the context of first sale, which exists uh, ev uh, everywhere else. Um, but there's also, I think, you know, with regard to hacking or, you know, fixing, you know, I, um, you know, I, uh, uh, when I was in college, I, I studied applied math and I had a bunch of uh, friends who were engineers and they're, they're all gearheads. And I mean that in the most affectionate way possible. Uh, you know, they love fixing things and they love tinkering things. Right. And I think it's worth considering. It's not just that, um, auto manufacturers, all these companies are trying to bilk you, uh, for every last cent for repair, or if we're talking about programmed obsolescence, um, then getting a new car or a new phone or refrigerator or whatever, um, every few years, but you're denying a lot Lot of people the ability to ply their trade to make these products last longer. Uh, and if we're having a serious discussion in this country about bringing manufacturing back, uh, I don't think this is going to be the be all end all, but I think we should, um, you know, repeal laws that make it harder for us to return to being like a, a, a nation of tinkerers. You know, when you attach criminal penalties to, you know, opening up and exploring your iPhone or whatever and potentially fixing it, um, that creates, uh, you know, there are downstream effects on just general culture and individual know-how. Uh, so I think there's there's something to be said for if we want to return um, you know, and, allow, and, and bring back more factoring in this country, we need to create an environment where people are comfortable uh, with getting their hands dirty and tinkering um, and everything like that. So <clears throat> those are two examples where, uh, yeah, they have serious implications um, for the broader uh, economy and also firms which are blocking uh, um, behaviors that are otherwise acceptable in the context of property law or basic consumer protection or things like that. Um, uh, that are just designed uh, so they can squeeze every last dollar they can um, out of the consumer in the lawsuit against the Massachusetts uh, ballot initiative uh, by the auto manufacturer is, I think, a great example of that. Okay. Um, so what's your opinion or, or maybe a, what are your thoughts about uh, the after effects one way or another from the, um, this uh, Oracle Google API copyright case um, that's uh, yes, uh, uh, it's still pending in the Supreme Court, I believe. Yes, that's correct. Uh, sorry, I missed, I dropped that from the last part of your question. No, no, it's uh, fine. So, 
I, I jumped yeah, around, uh, so uh, understandable. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, uh, so with respect to Google versus Oracle, um, the oral arguments, uh, which were early of um, last October, basically there are three you know, ish ways uh, that this case could be uh, could be brought. First, in the summer, the court surprised a lot of people by asking um, the uh, um, by asking Google and Oracle about questions with respect to standard of review, because the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit applied de novo review with respect to the question of fair use, which means they looked at it anew and disregarded. Um, the uh, jury verdict. So the first way they could do uh, the case could break is that they find that the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit applied the wrong standard of review and didn't sufficiently incorporate, um, uh, you know, the jury finding of fair use. I think that depends whether or not it's decided on those grounds depends entirely on how comfortable the justices feel uh, about differentiating uh, APIs, application programming interfaces, um, from regular computer code. Now that mm. doesn't mean like how comfortable they feel one way or the other, whether they put it in the same category as all of it or whether, um, you know, as, as other computer code, which is perfectly protectable by copyright law or whether they think it belongs in its own category. So it's entirely a comfort level. Um, and I think if the justices aren't comfortable making that type of decision, they'll say they apply the wrong standard of review, send it back to the court of appeals. And then, you know, we'll, probably see it at the Supreme Court again. Uh, let it percolate more in yeah. uh, lower courts to, to come up with a more articulate definition of uh, the differences between general computer code and something that communicates between two computers. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so the second way, and this is um, the way I am most uh, hopeful the court will decide it is a determination that the APIs in question uh, that Google re-implemented in the case um, are ineligible for copyright. This, in my opinion, is the ideal outcome because APIs are different from what's called um, implementing code. So uh, the the case. Um, you know, in computer code, we're constantly grasping for a metaphor. And the, my preferred method for an API is if you are at a restaurant um, and you ask uh, for, uh, you ask the waiter for um, a Caesar salad or something like that, you do not need to tell the waiter, you know, put these ingredients and do this to it and this, that, and the other thing. The recipe and the actual process of putting it together, that is the implementing code that goes behind the scene, but rather you uh, asking the waiter, I would like a Caesar salad. Um, that is the API and then the waiter knows to go to the kitchen and you just say Caesar salad and then they can do all sorts of stuff um, behind the scenes. Finding that that is not only um, highly abstract, uh, but also that there are so few ways to functionally express it in the Java programming language that it's ineligible um, for copyright. Uh, protection would, I think, be um, a significant win for um, interoperability because it seriously reduces the barriers uh, for what some folks call adversarial interoperability. So to go back to uh, uh, something I referenced before in the context of violating the terms of service, let's take that out of the equation for the moment. Um, if I you know, want to create a separate front end for interacting with Facebook, uh, just say for example, um, but Facebook holds the copyright on the application programming interfaces that which would be necessary for me to take all the photos, posts and everything like that and just present it in a separate front end. Um, right. That's a serious barrier for anyone who wants to create that separate uh, front end. They would have to either license it from Facebook um, or start from scratch uh, in developing its own implementing code uh, to interact with that. And, and Oracle's uh, attorneys, I think, correctly pointed out that simply creating a barrier doesn't necessarily, you know, the fact that uh, uh, copywriting something creates a barrier to implementation doesn't necessarily mean that it's ineligible. Now, that is true. Um, but uh, first, it depends on like how hard a barrier creates and how difficult it would be to overcome. But even so, if we're talking purely on policy grounds, we want to make that barrier as low as possible if we are concerned about competition, if we are concerned about interoperability. And of course, if the court decides uh, that they are ineligible for copyright protection, that would be um, a huge win. And then the final way the court excuse me, the case could be decided uh, would be on fair use grounds where it's yes, the APIs are in fact eligible for copyright protection. <clears throat> However, the way Google used it uh, in its Android operating system um, is fair. I am not quite sure 
uh, how the court um, would decide on that. In my opinion, I think the substantiality with respect to the broader Java SE package uh, that was used weighs heavily in favor of fair use. Um, the Court of Appeals said that the nature of the packages uh, is so functional that it weighs in favor of fair use. Um, and even though it's clearly used uh, for you know the, the financial benefit um, of Google, I think the nature of it and the amount of it used uh, cuts in favor of fair use, but I can't quite uh, uh, look into my crystal ball and see how the court would look. So that's from where I sit, uh, you know, how this case could break out. But broadly speaking, uh, um, you know, if we're talking about competition and we're talking about barriers to entry uh, for people to access data, uh, though using different platforms, um, I think this has huge implications. For example, in the House antitrust report that came out uh, last October or uh, November, I can't remember, um, when they discussed the need for interoperability uh, and data portability and reducing copyright, and even though it didn't explicitly mention this and certainly not in the context of Google v. Oracle, reducing those barriers to entry is the, uh, those barriers by making them ineligible for monopoly protection in the form of copyright um, is absolutely essential if we want to increase uh, um, that type of competition in the platform mm -hmm. case, uh, in, in, on the platform side. And even if uh, the court rules that Google's use was not fair and that the APIs are ineligible, or excuse me, are eligible for copyright protection, I think there's reason to be optimistic that Congress in the wake of this report and broader concerns about competition in the tech industry um, would craft separate laws, either um, you know, explicitly disqualifying APIs or similar um, code from copyright protection or taking computer code outside of copyright law entirely and mm. putting it into its uh, separate legal category. I doubt they would just bin the entire uh, um, class of things, but putting in its own separate legal category because the borrowing that you see is so ubiquitous and which is not, and you know, not to say the computer code can't be creative or the fruits of computer code can't be creative, um, but uh, the functional design uh, means that it's it's sort of odd to put it in the same category as you know literary works or music. Perhaps they put it in its own separate category. I can't quite speculate on what the nature of that reform would be, but even if Google v. Oracle goes in favor of Google, um, I think we can uh, be optimistic. Uh, about congressional action to fix these specific um, policy issues that would come from the finding of APIs uh, being eligible for copyright protection, and more importantly, the rights holders of the APIs uh, being able to sue any potential competitor uh, for using them in a way uh, of which they don't approve or haven't paid for. So in a way, uh, if the uh, if SCOTUS, the Supreme Court, um, oversteps are my opinion, I believe your opinion as well, and, um, and uh, deem uh, APIs as copyrightable and, um, and Google in this instance of uh, not uh, um, creating new APIs as uh, fair use um, or their implementation of the APIs as fair use, that it could spur the Congress to act finally rather than sitting on their hands to a certain extent like they've been doing for the last decade and letting this, uh, this issue um, brew and stifling competition, stifling innovation because of that. I think so. I'm fairly optimistic um, that that would uh, potentially be the outcome that it would spur um, uh, Congress to act. You also see on the Senate side, Senator Tom Tillis uh, is discussing a substantial reform of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act with uh, not only includes Section 1201, which deals with anti-circumvention measures, but also the notice and takedown system, which is a whole other can of worms. Um, right. But I think if we're having serious discussions about uh, both copyright law specifically and um, you know competition in tech, I'm I think that it is is likely we could see Congress. Um, you know, act in this way, even independent of Google v. Oracle, really, that it could, you know, say, uh, perhaps uh, no hard barriers, like you cannot design code that explicitly blocks, say, um, you know, a, uh, uh, you know, a, you know, a front end system um, that does that. I'm, 
I have mixed feelings about that. I'm not sure whether or not you need to pass such a hard regulation. Uh, but then again, it was, um, you know, executive and antitrust policy that made it so uh, phone numbers need to be interoperable. So you need, don't need to have a separate phone for your friends that use Verizon or, or, or Sprint or whatever. And we would think uh, that it, it'd be ridiculous to have to do that. So we could potentially see Congress move in a direction where 20 or 30 years from now, the fact that um, you know you, you at one point had to use Facebook's front end specifically in order to view all the information posted on, uh, on Facebook would be as ridiculous as needing a separate phone online um, to call, uh, you know, people who are on separate um, phone networks. So I think they could be moving in that direction if we're concerned about competition uh, in tech. And that's, you know, purely speculative. Who knows? 2020 has been one hell of a year. Uh, so, and, um, you know, it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future. Well, um, this has been a great discussion. Um, I'd like to pick this up with you again after the, after the new year, and we can talk about, um, the uh, some of the policy ideas that uh, Charles and Zach and I and um, some others that are um, we're developing and um, I I think it will be uh, interesting uh, for us to debate um, how uh, with a uh, a variety of different um, options both uh, regulatory um, and uh, uh, nonprofit organizations and uh, commercial, how possibly we could work together to come up with solutions. Because there, there has been some examples, um, maybe not this specific where um, there's uh, law in, involved that I'm aware of, but there have been some recent examples of these three organizations, types of organizations working together to come up with solutions. Um, but, uh, but more on that, um, uh, when we come back after the new year, I'd, I'd love to talk to you again. Uh, and, and I as well. Uh, fingers crossed. Stay uh, safe and uh, sane, everyone. <laughs> Definitely. You have a wonderful day. This has been Lincoln Shorts. Mm -hmm.